What's going on, everybody? What's going on? Troy Rawlings here. Welcome to another exciting episode of Meet the. Today on Meet the, I have um, actually, you know, a lot of times you people get interviews and be like, oh, a friend of mine, and we don't know each other. I've known <laughs> this cat since I was a brat. You know, we came up together in, in Baltimore. Um, oh, man. Uh, yeah. Be more, uh, man. DJ <laughs> basketball player. <laughs> Right. DJ basketball player, digital tech advisor. He used to have a show called The Digital Spin in Baltimore and EAA, and yeah. uh, all the way up to doing correspondence on the Today Show, Emmy Award winning talk show host, producer, uh, South by Southwest speaker, dot, 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 <laughs> on and on, father, husband, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> Give it up for Mario Armstrong. Man, it's good to be in the building with you, Troy, man. Uh, like you said, like a lot of times you'll jump on those interviews and you'd be like, oh, that's nice that they said that we know each other, but we don't really know each other. Like we really know each other so that it, it, we really do go back. It is it's really that real. Um, and Baltimore is like one of those communities that when you click and connect with somebody, it's it's a it's a small enough city. It's you know, it's big enough, but it yet small enough that. You know, it's easy for your families to start to connect and you keep you hold on to those relationships. So that's that's true. Right. What's that's so funny true. is even even in the spent and I like I told Mario, we do the Tarantino, we jump around a little bit and I give people their their uh, roses while they're alive. Mario was one of the fastest running basketball players ever. You did. You, if you <laughs> if you on his team and he say, let's go get down the court, <laughs> you better keep up. <laughs> look, keep look. Up. Look, look, no matter if it was sports, basketball or whatever, if it's your passion or your career or, you know, because that's what I'm big into is like really helping people understand how to move forward in their life. But how to do this entrepreneurial thing, how to make your side hustle the real hustle, how to really pursue your passions with with uh, real in, real impact and income. And you maybe just think of it. It's true. One of the things that I tell people today that I didn't even realize that I was doing back then was that you got to lean into like what makes you unique. Like if you if you if you're honest with yourself as to what makes you unique, if you can be vulnerable with yourself with what makes you unique, you can use that as a superpower. So as an adult, I'm using the fact that I I I uniquely have a God-given talent for energy. I just uniquely have have energy and I uniquely uh want to see the best in other human beings and I just feel committed to doing that. And I'm unique. I got curly hair. I'm unique because I'm short. But as it really and it related to basketball, I was unique because I was fast. So what I did now that you say this is like I was always leaning into the thing that would make me unique to help me elevate or be successful in that moment. So when I was on the court, you short. Yo, you a point guard. You're not the greatest shooter, but you can make plays and you can see the court, but you're fast. You can get steals. You can get the team going. You can put the defense on their heels. So I knew, like, just, I guess, subconsciously, like, yo, that's one of my strengths. Um, but now we're adults. We try to get all more calculated about what our strengths are so we can figure out how to make money from them. Back then, I was just trying to win basketball games down in Camfield and Bedford and BNBL and playing down there in Cold Spring. And I was just trying to win games. <laughs> right, right. And, and what's so funny is, um, and I didn't even, you know, I said when we dialogue, it starts happening with the energy. I was looking at some of your posts and your story. If you want to be motivated, make sure you follow at Mario Armstrong on Instagram, let alone the Never Settle TV, the shows, everything. Um, I got to give you flowers, like I said, while you're alive. I love doing it. Um, I don't know if you remember. I'm trying to think exactly which one. At one point in time, when I was well throughout your whole life, you probably don't remember. I'm a I'm I'm like between you and your brother's age. I think your brother's younger than me. You're a little older than me. So, and your brother, shout out to DJ Face, Sean Armstrong. He was my <laughs> first my first DJ for my first comedy night in Baltimore. My first right. ongoing comedy night. Face became my DJ. He became my kid Capri. I didn't know that. That's crazy. We were talking the other day while he was spinning. But I, I want to say this because I know it's unintentional a lot of times when some of the things we do, we're just being ourselves. But you don't know who look at you, the following generation that look at you and people that watch you. Mm -hmm. So it was certain things you were doing that I always knew I had a love for radio and wanted to get in certain things. 
I was I was too young to get into the UMBC parties, but I had a dance crew, so we would go and I'd see you over there because I think you was a Kappa. So yeah. you'd be over there with the cat, leading them, same energy, leading them, dancing around. I was like, it's Mario again. And, and then certain times <laughs> I'm going to put together things for the Baltimore Jazz Review or meet and, or go to networking events. And you would be up there shaking hands with the people speaking, taking a minute. I remember one time, I don't know if it was Willie, it was Willie Gary. Oh. And I was in the line to meet billionaire lawyer Willie Gary, just to kind of shake his hand and say, hey. And I think it was Willie Gary. I don't think it was yeah. Bob Johnson. You might have been at that one too. But Willie Gary, you shook his hand and you had this look on your face that whatever I have to say in these 30 seconds, I'm going to make sure he remembers me. I think he was still on the mayor's council um, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but you don't know that people are watching you like that. Right. You go how, is that how does that affect you now? Is it still as unintentional or has intention played a bigger role, like you said, since you know that you have the power of energy in you? Yo, that's a really great question, man. Um, it's a combination of both. It's, you know, it's because I can tell that in situations where things just, it's unintentional, but it's such a part of my subconscious that it just happens naturally. Or like, you know, something will switch and it will happen naturally. And then there are the, oh, I know I'm going to see this person or I know I'm going to meet with them or I'm in a line waiting to you know, see somebody, like you said back then, you know, uh, so I had a minute to think about it. I think the thing that really helps me the most is constantly reminding myself what my why is, constantly understanding, like, what, what am I out here trying to do? What am, I'm out here trying to build, I'm out here trying to build productions, I'm out here trying to build shows, shows that have high production value that can be, that can help people get the advice, the tips, and the information they need to move forward on their projects, their ideas, to uplift them, to help them level up, and to help them move forward and not deal with the same potholes that I faced or that some of my guests face. And so, you know, when I'm trying to create content that's based around motivating people with substance, you kind of you kind of get to this place in your mind, like, all right, <clears throat> I know what my mission is. I remind myself every day what that mission is. Right. And you, I start doing these little exercises where I'm like, if I bump into, if I bump into Shaq in the street, what am I going to say? Mm. If I bump into, um, you know, Richard Branson, you know, cause we do our show over at NASDAQ, over at NASDAQ in Times Square. Like I'm in Times Square at the, what the stock market's joint, like in the, uh, the ground floor studio right next door to today. So I could bump into, in America, uh, like if I if I bump into Michael Strahan, what am I gonna say? You know, so like I'll just quiz myself from time to time just to think like, what's that thirty seconds? And I think that that keeps me sharp because it changes like wh who we are, what we need, where we where we are in our stage of evolution, and what we're going through. It all changes. Sometimes I, you need I, some, I, I tell you know, my folks all the time: if you see me writing, that means you should be writing. <laughs> that's, uh, good. that's good so, i like that. that's good yeah if you see if you if i'm doing an interview i'm back if i'm doing an interview and i'm writing you should be writing uh so rip let's flip the script let's let's go back a little bit so okay. you went to college you 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 went to umbc i don't know if you did undergrad any i mean um grad school anywhere or whatever you went to you were at umbc Yo, so I'll give you a story that very few have ever heard. In fact, I think I'm finally, and it's not that it's like I was afraid of it or ashamed of it. It's just that it never seemed to be something that needed to come up at the time. But um, it's going to come up, I think, next week in my podcast, which is a very short podcast. Y'all can check it out. It's called Wake Up and Level Up. Just look for it, Wake Up and Level Up, or go to wakeupandlevelup.com for it. Um, but I started by going to West Virginia State. So West oh. Virginia State, by the way, is an HBCU. A lot of people don't know right. this, but it's an HBCU. So I go to this school, and my high school career was was crappy. Like I did C, maybe C plus. Like I was probably a C minus C student. Like <laughs> yeah, it just I couldn't get into it, man. It was like one or two classes that would really like connect with me, and then everything else was just like whatever. And I just didn't take it serious and didn't really respect it. And so I go off to college. In my first semester of my freshman year, I knew exactly what I wanted to go to school for, communications. Like, I knew I wanted to be 
talking, speaking on camera, on a microphone. Like I knew that. So best grades of my life, first of all. I'm calling my mom, telling her to report before I'm coming home for like Thanksgiving break. Like I got these grades, she's super proud, I'm super proud. I turn around, go back to that same school for the second semester in the spring, pledge Kappa. While I'm pledging and while I'm going through that uh, phase, a local dude, a local gangster decided that I was going to be his punching bag. And he had targeted me, basically bullied, bullying me, but he was this off-campus off high school game or off-campus, you know, it was, yeah, it was off-campus high school game. Some seniors were playing or something. And everybody was like, yo, we're going to go to this high school game. So we all went, we're freshmen. I don't really know these cats that I'm rolling with to this game. We're all freshmen. We don't really know each other. We just got into a dorm together just a couple months ago. So I, we go to this game. And for some reason, dude decides to square off on me. I'm short. I'm an easy target, bro. I got curly hair. I'm thin. I look out of place. I'm trying to dress and look and look fly. Like, I'm out of place. I'm in West Virginia in a country town around, you know, and I'm looking like a city kind of like slickster kind of cat that doesn't look like a gangster. Just looks like a pretty, pretty city cat, like not a hardcore city cat. And so he uh targeted me man and for whatever reason we get to fighting and it got bad and the fights would just escalate like he was now coming on the campus parties and he would show up at campus parties and now we're fighting at campus parties and it was just gotten it got out of control to the point where he basically shot at me and so in my second so yes my second semester of my freshman year the best grades of my life i'm in a zone I'm doing what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. And now I'm being shot at by a local thug who runs a gang in that community off campus. And my parents are like, zoop, you out. And from that point, college never landed right for me again. So when you saw me at UMBC, I had already made a pit stop at Hampton. I went there for a semester. Couldn't, didn't, couldn't get into the groove there. Just was, just was out of place trying to find my fit. Didn't work. Came back home, Catonsville Community College for like a semester. Did that for a minute. And I was like, man, I don't want to be, I want to be on campus. So then it was like, all right, let's go to UMBC. Went to UMBC. Did, went there for two semesters. Didn't finish. Like I didn't finish college. But it all goes back to like this one moment that changes the trajectory of everything. So then you right, have to ask right. yourself, well, well, what did that, what did you learn from that moment? Or what did it teach you? And it looks like because I didn't have to go, th because I didn't have that regular process, or going through that uh, kind of process and journey that way, I really had to learn how to fight for myself. And so being out of college, not having a college degree, when everybody back then was getting college degrees, it wasn't like now where you could be like, yo, I can start developing stuff at the age of 18. I don't have to do this. I don't have to go to college. Like you needed that college degree if you wanted to get a decent job back then, unless you were just a, one of them really weird entrepreneurs that was out there. And so, right. Man, I found myself in sales jobs because they were the only jobs that would take somebody without a daggone degree. So that learning sales at the age of 20, 21, 22, like changed everything. Because then I got into the psychology of how sales work, how people work. How do you how do you try to get what you want? How do you meet people both ways? How do you give and how do you take? Like all of that was early training in the 20s. And so I think that really was the best schooling that I ever got. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think this is the first time. But that's how that's how it happened. So when you saw me, you would see me on UMBC's campus. I was DJing. I was going to school, really wasn't still clicking. They didn't have a communications major. So I was just taking a major to try to do a degree to do a degree. You know, basically, y'all, if you're not on your passion and you're not on your purpose, no matter how much you try to force it, it's not going to work. And so what I didn't understand at that time and what I try to communicate to people now is like, you have to answer the purpose that's calling for you. A lot of times you're trying to hang up the phone or you're trying to like, you know, pick up a two way or you try right, right. to like, you trying to ignore that call, like answer the purpose that's calling for you, not the one that you think you should be doing. And you're going to find more success quicker. I, I like uh, comedian Dane Cook said something years ago when I was. In the kind of thing I was just figuring out, and I knew same kind of scenario. My grades ain't all that, but I've been cutting hair for a while. I know if I go to barbering school out of high school, I can make money. Mm. But the Broadcast Institute of Maryland was like, "You did great on this test. Why don't you come this way?" But it's mm. hard to tell them, "Hey, I'm living by myself." 
You know what I'm saying? So people don't, I told you, me and my brother are going to do something soon because people don't know the story. They'll see the glory. They see your right. energy, but they don't know that I had to press the gas on this thing to see. It comes to a point, and Barack Obama talks about it in the beginning of the audacity of hope. He said there was a point when he had got smashed in one of the local elections. So he was like going back to work, seeing how the earth rotate around the sun. And he came up with this cockamamie idea to run for like Senate or, you know, or con you know, he wanted to run and told his wife, but she had been cool with, I'm paraphrasing, she had been cool with how everything was going. And she was like, well, I hear you saying you want to go back out there after all that happened. And I'm, I like the way our family is rolling and we raising our daughters and we both work and don't think you got my vote. <laughs> and he said, there's going to come a time where it's you, your vision, and pretty much God. <laughs> and you got to decide, am I going to do this no matter what? So that to me explains um, the birth and the energy of never settle. That explains right. why when I was looking at you, everything seemed like you went so hard. Same thing if you have to defend yourself against some bully. It was like everything in my life is energy. And if I'm going to turn even a fear, have to flip the script. Look, this guy's big. He's doing whatever. He just that another. But, you know, he, he all right, let me pick on this dude because my because you ain't you wasn't there when his girl said, oh, he cute. He's like, who, who cute? Right, 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 right. <laughs> you never saw the little thing. Y'all women are right. cold blooded. Right. Tell, you never saw right. the little that. thing that's popping. His sister. <laughs> his sister said, oh, he cute. Who cute? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ain't going to be no cute around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. How are these college boys coming in here? Right, right. You know, that's so. it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's probably exactly <laughs> it. So. Yeah. so, so for some people, for some of y'all, y'all like, oh my god, I couldn't imagine. Well, some of y'all, your bully is your job. Your bully is your boss. How do you tell a person, especially at a time like this? For those that, I don't usually date the shows, but for those that are watching now, it's 2020. It's the fall of 2020. Yeah. COVID. We got a president that's a bully. Um, right. Right. All this stuff is going on, but more people than ever have lost jobs that they were saying they weren't happy with anyway. How do yep. you how do you tell those people? Or what advice can you give the person that's trying to figure it out? Because you you a big part of your testimony is is that you know you remember ten years ago looking in your bank account and being broke broke, and you're still trying to and and in your mind and in your heart this vision is going for. Your wife is there. She she got your back. I'm, I'm sure y'all had the ups and downs of everything. We got to do something, baby. And you're yep. figuring it out. How did you transition? Because um, I don't know what your job was before you decided to do Never Settle. How did you transition that? Because it, to me, on the outside, it looks like you went cold turkey and you and your wife had to have some serious conversations. And you said, I got to go for it. Because yeah. the energy you were putting behind it. How do you transition from the nine to five to doing what you're passionate about? Yeah, especially a nine to five that you don't that you don't like anyway. So, I, you know, my nine to fives, I kind of liked even though I was doing a side hustle because I always had a, a different picture and a different vision for what I wanted to try to create outside of my job. So I think for those of you that are being real with yourself, COVID has forced you, especially in the early part of COVID, you were forced to be like, let me reassess myself. Do I like do I like the person I'm with? Do I like. Do I like the job that I have? Do I really want to go back to that? And now some of you don't even have that job to go back to that you used to not like. You would have stomach aches come Sunday because you know you got to go in on Monday. You trying to you call out. You So this was actually, as long as you didn't have any family members that have died from it, like I've had two that passed away from COVID. Um, so I don't want to bring any light. I don't want to bring light to like how COVID can be like a silver lining for you. Like COVID's clearly killing thousands of people. But for those of you that are alive, th those of you that are still well, and those of you that are still here, there's no excuse for you to say, I've gotten time. What am I doing with this time? Because everybody's had that same, we all got centered back to zero with something that we couldn't control. And so the question is, are you going to be mindful with that time? Or are you going to be mindless with that time? So I was telling people early in April, I was like, yo, y'all better start studying. Y'all better rapidly acquire some new skills. Y'all better start reading. Y'all better take some college courses for free because you can online. Y'all better start like working on that hobby that you always said you wanted to do but never had time for. Build that website. Write that book. Start that podcast. Like stop playing with your gift and your talent is what I was really saying to people. Like now what's the excuse? Right. You always said it was time. 
now what's the excuse? Like, hu- adult humans need to get real with themselves is what I'm saying. We all have insecurities. We all have shortcomings. Nobody is perfect. But are you willing to work on the thing that would really bring you the most happiness? Are you really willing to put in the consistency and the commitment that it actually takes? And so when I think about our bank account going flat broke, you know, I was the one that tried, I was the one that convinced my wife, like, let's go and do our own company. And then six months after convincing her to leave her job, because I got laid off. I don't know if you know that, but I had gotten laid off. And then mm-hmm. that's when I decided, t- took my side gig. And I was like, yo, let's just make this thing the full time thing. She comes on board. Six months later, it's 2008. And we get hit with the recession. We have about a year's worth of savings. Obviously, we ain't make it. We plow through that. So now things get really bad. Her mother-in-law is having to buy me groceries. We, we out of money. We, we're like, you know, credit card debt is the only way we were like surviving. We have a son, Christopher, that we're trying to raise. So things got really, really rough. Like I was taking coins to the coin star machine and getting and getting dollars for gas money. So like we hit our bottom. Now everybody's bottom is a different bottom, but we, that was our bottom. And so right. when I think about the pandemic now and I'm like, yo, this is like the first bottom for so many people. So, so, so many people, this might be your first bottom. Or this might be the worst bottom that you've ever had to hit. And what I'm saying to you is if you can actually start to identify, like, stop playing games with your gift and really say, what is it I really want to do with the rest of my life? What is it that I've always talked about that I get excited about that I'm happy about? Maybe you haven't had maybe you haven't figured out how to make money doing it. That's fine. But what is it? Do you know what it is? Have you even done enough self-discovery to say, I know what it is so that you can start doing the research to try to find out how to actually make money doing it? Or are you talking to people like Troy? Are you talking to people like Mario that care about you, that can help give you some ideas and perspectives on how you can a- actually monetize that thing? So right, I right. think that if if people are really like stuck, the question was, you know, if they're unhappy or they don't want to go back to that job, this is the time for you to break north. Like this is the time to break. Every, you don't have to worry about what's it look like, you know, that I that I was I was only there for three months or six months. Like, you don't have to worry about it. Like, everybody's blaming COVID. <laughs> Corporations are blaming COVID. The world, the world is shut down. <laughs> OK, everybody's blaming COVID. So you get that benefit as well. So I just think that right now, while you still have time, because we're still in this pandemic and I don't really see us coming fully out of this in the way that people want to go back to for a good little while still. Um, I mean, you know. There's going to have to be some developments that really take place in terms of vaccines and other things and people really believe in those vaccines and that they actually work and no side effects. Like this a lot that still has to take place. And we've been hit hard. Like I'm used to being out on the road. And I know you've been, you know, you out, you supposed to be out shows, events, nights, yeah. club, you know what I mean? So, so we've all had to pivot. And so I, I just think that, you know, if something's important enough, you got to do it, even if all the odds are against you. So I want to I want to jump into this. I know we don't have a we don't have a lot of time, but uh, we had to make do a part two. <laughs> we had to do a part two. Um, I'm down. You, for that. Like I said, I remember you doing digital spin. What got you into the tech side? Were you always kind of a techie? You started doing digital spin, and then it. I I, I know you were doing the digital piece with the mayor's department. Like, how did you get in that spin of things? Was that your you got you got very information minded because a lot of stuff, a lot of tips in, initially you were doing were in that lane. How did you get into that? The digital you know, lifestyle. You know what's crazy, man? Really, I am not like a, a techie like that. Like people think because of the persona that I'm like, look at your face. You're like, what? Like, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like yo, I like, like y'all don't know the full. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm telling the story from back. This this um when you see him, even I mean, he became the digital lifestyle guy on the Today Show. Right. So on in New York, you know, so in right. Baltimore, he had a show on EAA called The Digital Spin. So I'm like, so how? <laughs> so it all started. Because, so here's the deal. I'll, I'll, I'll do the story in a, in, a, in a shortened fashion. I wanted to host a radio show fresh out of college. Well, I wasn't in college, but, you know, during that college time when it ain't work out, I was like, yo, I want to host a radio show because I knew communications was my thing. So okay. I found a, I found an AM station. I saw an ad. And I, and, they, and I was like, I want to do this show. And they were like, what's the show on? And I was like, you know, I'm going to talk. Because they had shows for everything. Politics, money, blah, blah. I was like, you know what everybody's not talking about? Everybody's not talking about tech. And I knew enough about technology. But I was self-taught. But the only reason why I was self-taught is because I liked the gadgets, like, intrigued me. 
So the electronic things like in that communications framework of, of like, you know, I like to be on air, but I also like the things that buzzed and made noises. And I'm, and, but I didn't want to make, I didn't really want to build them. I just wanted to teach people how to use them. So I became like a really smart expert in understanding how technology helps us be more productive, helps us pursue our passion, helps us with our life. And so that's where my, my benefit, that's where my strength became. And I started doing some teaching on the side where I was teaching people how to use like Microsoft Office or how to network computers. Like I started being paid to actually teach people. So I had this level of expertise that was happening. I was like, man, I just need to translate this to, to an on-air show because I really just won't get on air. So I knew that being black, being in tech and being on air was going to be pretty unique. So let me get on air. Let me start this AM show. Then after I did the AM show, I used that to try to convince some Baltimore FM stations. WEAA was one of those stations that was like, yeah, we'll take it. We'll put you on. So then they put me on. And then now I'm on FM radio. And now I'm like trying to figure out how to take this radio thing and get to TV because really that's really where I want to go. Right. So I use this formula that I call from free to fee, where I think about things that I can do for free that will eventually get me a fee. So when I did that AM radio show, I had a, a daytime job, but I didn't get paid by that station. In fact, I had to give them money in order to buy the half hour. I when I did WEAA, I did that for three years. Never got a dime. Never got paid. It was all about learning, building up my experience, and building up the credibility. So then when I went to Channel 2, which was WMAR-TV, it was ABC station in Baltimore, I said, hey, I've been doing this radio show for a couple of years. I really want to take the same idea and do it on TV. And I want to do a segment every Thursday called Tech Tip Thursday. And by the way, I'll do it for free. They were like, wait, you're going to offer up content to our viewers about technology, which was important. And they don't have anybody that can do that. So I was putting myself in a market. We call it the white space. I'm putting myself into a market where there's not a lot of competition. You had a lot of people doing finance. You had a lot of people doing uh, money the and white all that. Space. The white yeah. space. I like that. And, and then, and then subliminally, like, you know, that's why I'm like, you know, it's called the black space. <laughs> like, y'all called it the white space. It's called the black space because that's right, how, because right. we inventive like that. We, we, in, right, we, right. we're the ones that invented the black space. Like, because y'all ain't giving us nothing. We're going to show you where the gap is and we're going to insert ourselves into the gap and watch what we do when we insert ourselves into the gap. Right? Like, uh -huh. let's just keep it. So, um, so that's how it all started, man. And then I just, I went, and they were like, yeah, we'll take you. And then I did that. And then the Today Show noticed me and Rachel Ray and Steve Harvey. Like, it still was me trying to push my, put myself out there. But there was this finding my uniqueness, leaning into that, oh, nobody's talking about tech. You seem to know what you're talking about. You got some credentials and some expertise, but really you want to be on TV changing people's lives. And guess what? People need help with tech right now more than anything. But now my brand has evolved from that. That was 10 years ago. Now it's like everybody's got a help desk. Everybody's got a teenager that can help them make decisions. And people have gotten smarter in terms of like buying technology and how to use it. So how does Mario evolve? I'm not just going to continue to just be the tech guy. Sure, I still talk about it. I use it, but that's 20% of what I do. Now it's all about how do you build your dream? How do you make several revenue streams of income? How do you become an entrepreneur? How do you actually get that book done that could change the world for people? Like, how do you actually get things done that matter to you is more of what I'm about now. And I, I know we got a hard stop, but it, you brought it all the way up to the never settle and you want an Emmy. So mm -hmm. how, <laughs> how did it, and I remember the campaigns and the, 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 funding and the and and you talking about how you were getting sponsors and stuff like that so how did the never settle even was it being at the today show that told you you wanted to yeah you can grab me bring it up <laughs> was it being at the today show that told you you wanted to um have it there in new york because you had admit about having it in new york as well right yeah so i think you know, it's important for people to have a very big vision for themselves. Many people would say to me, yo, you made it. Like I was on the Today Show coming out of Baltimore. They were like, yo, you made it. Like I'm seeing five, six million people uh, 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 when I go on the air. And I was on there regularly, like regularly. Like it was a lot. And, and I would just be so thankful that people were just like seeing that as like a way of Mario's made it. He represents our city. You know, he does a good job. He ain't out there doing foolishness. 
and, and we and we can call him our homeboy for real, for real. Like he's down, he's you know he's got our back type of thing. And I always appreciated that. But what was really curious, what was really interesting to me is that was never the end game for me. Like as big as that was to get to that Super Bowl, I was like, nah, there's something called the World Cup. Like the World Cup is like bigger than the suit. Y'all can sleep, y'all. In the U.S., the Super Bowl is big, but globally, they get 100,000 people per game. <laughs> globally, the World Cup is, I'm trying to get to the World Cup. So I always saw it, not that they were just a stepping stone, but I did not see it as my final destination. That's why when you ask the question, like, what did you see for yourself for the show? Was it New York? It wasn't New York. It was the fact that you have to have a dream and a vision for yourself that goes beyond what you even think is attainable. Because then once you, I, before that, the Today Show was unattainable. Before that, getting on CNN regularly was unattainable. Before that, getting on WEAA was unattainable. Like everything was unattainable until it became attainable. So, exactly. you know what I'm saying? So I think a Nelson, there's a Nelson Mandela quote that, that talks specifically about that. Like, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, um, um, unfortunately, but it's something that nothing's impossible until it's, in, until it's possible. Basically, until someone sees it, it's done. It was impossible until it's done. So when we decided to do this show, we didn't have any money. And I had to try to get brands to buy into the idea. And we didn't have a studio. So I called, a comp I called some tech companies. And I was like, can we do our show in your lobby um, for free? And Because right, we're going right. to shoot the show at 7 o'clock at night. Can we shoot it in your lobby? And one of the companies called back and said, yeah, you can do it. So we literally shot our show in a company's lobby with 50 seats and had the show done there as our start. And I think a lot of people stop on their start because they think it needs to be perfect or it needs to be ready or it's got to be done. Like the most important thing is for you to start putting your thing out there because the minute we did that, then the universe started conspiring. God started conspiring. The energy started conspiring to help us. At the end of those six episodes, I was packing up the show. We had just killed it. Hundred thousands of viewers online watching the show. We killed it. And I'm packing up a U-Haul truck. Like you talk about being humbled. Like just a week or two ago, I was signing autographs from people. Just two weeks ago, I was signing autographs from people. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm I'm out here, you know, in a sweatsuit, you know, packing up the U-Haul truck and, and driving this stuff back to, to Baltimore to put it in some storage. And then we get a phone call three months later because we didn't know what we were gonna do with the show. We were out of money, didn't have we borrowed somebody's lobby, and then we get a phone call from NASDAQ. We see your show. Would y'all like to do that show over here? So my point is, stop stop looking for people to put you on and just do the work and promote your work. Don't be bashful. Don't be hesitant promoting your work. That's why you knew what we were up to. Because I was promoting right. the show before the show happened. I was showing you like, hey, we're going to do this show. Do you have it yet? No. But I'm telling y'all about what it's going to be. And I would tell y'all. And so I was giving myself accountability, but I was also putting it out there to show you like, no, we're going to document this journey. And, and, and that's how we ended up coming up with the show, doing it in New York. I knew I wanted to do it on a big stage. And so that was either going to be New York or L.A. Mm -hmm. That was like when I look at you, I'm like, yo, he did it. Like I look at you in the same way. Like you might not be where you want to be yet, Troy, but you've had wins for sure. And you did something that a lot of people are scared to do. Leave the nest. Go and actually go to where the action is. Like, yo, I'm in comedy where there's really only two places I need to be in my life if I'm really serious about this. L.A. Mm -hmm. and New York. And, and, like, and like you, hey. people don't understand. I, I tell people all the time, I wanted to see how this, how my live show production skills, I, I love producing shows at the Lyric and the Meyerhoff and wherever I was producing the live concerts, the music concerts and comedy and doing stuff at venues, but I wanted to see how my live show production skills translated into TV and film. That's mm. what made me come to LA to learn TV and film. And within <laughs> eight months, I got my first development deal. And by 2011, I did the pilot that aired on NBC in Baltimore. Thank God for Wanda Draper. <laughs> Wanda Draper. That's the yeah. man relationships and you do the work, then people can help you when they're in positions. That's you know, right. um, it's like it's, it's it's interesting. I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but I'm I'm grateful th that we've been able to have success. And I'm grateful that we've had a lot of failures that makes me appreciate the success even more. But right now, 
literally right now, I have just put together an Excel spreadsheet with 50 names of people that I'm sending a two minute personal pitch video. So I basically went into my little studio in the basement and said, hey, Kevin Hart, I don't know you. My name's Mario Armstrong. Here's my body of work. Here's what I've done. And you see all the B-roll and you see all the hype and you see all the energy. And then I say, all I really want from you is an 11 minute phone call because I either want one of two things to see if you could be a mentor to me or see if you could be a co-production partner on, on our on our show or be an EP on our show. And I put in maybe one other little thought. I said, basically, I'm just trying to connect with other people of color that are in this business that are successful, that can see that I've been putting in my body of work and that I'm legit. And I just want to get an 11 minute phone call with you to see if there's any reason for us to do anything further. Like that's it. And now I'm recording 50 of them. So oh, no, hey. I don't want anybody anyway. to think like oh, Mario made it. He got the Emmy. He good. He got it. Like, no, I'm still on the grind. I'm still the hustle. I call it the mindful hustle because we can be mindful about how we hustle. We don't have to be right. getting diabetes and getting hypertension and becoming all stressed out. We can be more mindful and more empathetic and, and smarter about how we hustle, but we still got to hustle if you believe in what you believe in. So I say to people like, yo, do your actions match your ambition? Right. Because if you got ambition, but you ain't got the actions to match it, it ain't going to happen. You just wishing. That's right. That's right. Hey, I know <laughs> we could talk, but I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to, because I know somebody's behind me like, <laughs> Mario's <laughs> schedule is tight. <laughs> but but I, I do want to say this before we get out of here. Um, put me down. I want to see it. I want to be able to push it here in Los Angeles um, because I'm, I'm believing, I, I believe in the back door. The awesome thing I love about social media um, is that there's always a way to get in touch with somebody. And I've, I've talked, right. people look at who I've interviewed in your episode, believe it, I started this last year just wanting to get my TV and my interview chops back up. Ah, You're smart. episode 76 now, though. What? So, and, and see, the thing is, I didn't even know that that was your goal, but the way you're doing this and conducting this, it does feel like, and I'm, and I'm a TV person, like I could say this, and I'm not just saying this because we know each other, because I just wouldn't answer. I just, I was just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything if I had something bad to say about you. Um, it feels like that level. Like it feels like this feel. Like I really, I know we're short on time, so we got to do a part two. But it's also because I'm excited because of how your like your demeanor, the questions. I love how you dance throughout this whole thing. And so clearly, seventy six episodes later, I didn't know that you were trying to bone up them skills. And now I can actually say, yo, the skills are you're, you're tight. You're good. The skills are straight, and that, like, that means a lot. We gotta, we gotta, like I said, we gotta, we gotta chop it up. And and but I want y'all to recognize that Mario, a person who mentors people, like he's mentoring me, has throughout his life, whether he knew it or not, I was watching, and still does it. Still does a grind to get in touch with other people who he considers mentors. So it does not stop. You know, I love the fact that you mentioned Richard Branson. But you sit and talk to Richard Branson, he'll probably tell you a lot. He, yeah, he has the wherewithal and financial peace to do things the way he wants to. But I got a couple of his books on the shelf. If you read yep. his methodology, it's not basic. It's Yo. not. A lot of people talk about how he fumbles, but Two he has the wherewithal ago. to fumble. Two years ago, I got invited to the man's island. Two years ago, I'm flying to to uh, Miami to then. Uh, to cross over to, to yo, know, the, the man has a, a private island, man. I was, <laughs> and, and what's so funny is people don't realize, like, most people would say, Oh, I'm gonna get this big house, stuff like that. When he bought that island, I think he bought it for like 280,000, right? Nothing was on it, nothing was on it, and it was with his first deal with like, I don't know if it was Rolling Stones, Madonna, whoever he had the first for one of his first deal or whatever, yeah, and he just built on it continuously. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, he everything like the, the pl there was no plumbing, there was nothing, there was no electricity, nothing, like nothing. <laughs> you talking about vision? So, Mario yeah, Armstrong, right. how can people get in touch with you? Because I no, we gotta come back with a part two. We got we we got so many more Baltimore stories to share too, man. We gotta come back with a part two. Um, yeah. They can get in touch with me. My favorite place is Instagram at Mario Armstrong on Instagram. You can always DM me there if you need any uh, help or advice or just need somebody to talk to that would care. To listen, uh, you can hit me there. The website is neversettled.tv. And if you want to watch any of the videos that we've produced, 
just go to YouTube and go to Never Settle Show. We got a lot of content there that can help you with uh, moving forward on some of your ideas and projects. The the great one, the Emmy Award winning, Time. much more to come, my man, Mario Armstrong. Thank you, brother. I'm so sorry that we had a, a, a tight a tight break on this one, but let's do a part two so we can add that to this so that we don't leave people hanging. And I know that you and I have other questions and more conversation for each other that I want to get into. So let's do a part two. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I, I appreciate you taking time out, bro. All right, bro. It's good to see you, man. Yes, indeed. Talk to you soon. Okay. Talk to you soon. Peace.